When it comes to music player controls, the iPod's click wheel is actually way better than most people give it credit for. It's intuitive, fast, and you can infinitely scroll without lifting your finger because it's a circle. But as amazing as it is, it's lacking in one big feature. Tactile feedback. We humans have evolved to be especially sensitive to touch, and when it comes to handling various tools, being able to interact with tactile feedback is actually something encoded in our DNA. That's why it's so much more satisfying to type on a mechanical keyboard than on a touch screen. So today we will be adding haptic feedback to the iPod click wheel, but we're not going to be adding just any old vibration motor. We'll be adding Apple's very own Taptic Engine. In this tutorial, we'll be specifically looking at the iPhone 7 Taptic Engine. While parts from newer iPhones might work, this model is the most common and cheapest to buy in bulk. A quick word of warning though, you should definitely avoid using the Taptic Engine from the iPhone 6S, because they're very inconsistent. And out of the handful of success motors I've tested, only about half of them worked. And the other half either had no output or just really weak output clicking. I've already tested them all inside an iPhone, so they seem to work fine. I think it's got something to do with manufacturing variances, but since these weren't built to work inside an iPod, it could be anyone's guess. On the other hand, every single iPhone 7 Taptic Engine worked just fine. As for the iPod itself, we'll be using this monochrome iPod 4th generation. Earlier models as well as the modern classic and mini might also work, but that's going to be with another video in the future. So for now, we're going to be sticking with the 4th gen mono. And on top of that, the iPod must be flash modded because the Taptic Engine won't fit when there's a hard drive. And if you've also installed a 3000 mAh battery, then the placement will be slightly different. But we'll look at that later. Let's begin. First, we're going to open up the iPod using a metal pry tool. Just slide it into the side and pry upwards until the front comes loose, like this. Now, the front and back are still connected by a headphone cable here, so we can't pull it open just yet. We need to use a pair of tweezers and gently rock it until it pops off. And you can see this iPod has already been flash modded with a generic green board and red adapter. We can take the front half and put it aside because we won't be doing anything with the logic board. Instead, everything takes place on this back half here. Now, how this mod works is we'll be removing this clicker speaker from the headphone board and wiring a Taptic engine in its place. The clicker has three contacts, one on this side and two on this side. We'll need to melt these connections with a soldering iron and lift the clicker off the board. To save time, here's one I prepared earlier. It's a fairly simple step. Just be careful not to touch the soldering iron with any plastic parts or they can melt or burn. I find it helps to unscrew the board from the back plate and remove the plastic frame for this step, then pry the speaker off with a blade or something similar. With the clicker removed, we can turn our attention to the Taptic engine itself. Now, you may be asking, hey Michi, how the heck am I supposed to solder wires to these tiny contacts on the ribbon connector? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We won't. You see, the iPhone 7 Taptic Engine has a little secret, and in order to reveal its mystery, we're going to need help from our old friend, alcohol. With some isopropyl alcohol and a cotton bud, I'm going to gently wipe away on this side of the Taptic Engine, and eventually we'll find a secret hidden diagnostics port under that ink. If we lift away the tape, we now have direct connections to the motor, bypassing the ribbon plug completely. Before we do any soldering, I also want to remove these two metal tabs on the side. Normally these are used for holding the Taptic Engine inside the iPhone, but they're useless inside an iPod, so they can go. For this step, we're going to need edge cutters and safety goggles, so make sure you've got your safety specs on, because metal can end up flying everywhere, and trust me, you don't want to be explaining to a doctor how you manage to blind yourself while taking a vibrator to the face. We're not going to cut through the metal though. Instead, I'm going to firmly grip the Taptic Engine with one hand, and grab the loop with the cutters, then slowly rock it back and forth. The loop will eventually come loose, and the welder spot will give away, releasing the loop. Then, I can do the same with the other side. Since we won't be using the plug here or the ribbon cable, it's safe to trim it off, so that's going to be one less thing to worry about later. Now, the Taptic Engine is ready for soldering. We are going to be soldering to pads 1 and pad 6. The rest should be left untouched. And 
we're going to start with the position of the shield on the right. I'm just going to put some caps on tape onto the pads just to cover up everything except for the leftmost one. That way we don't accidentally cross over anything like this. Next, I'm going to apply some flux fluid and then gently just dab some solder onto the pad. Normally when tinning a pad, I would touch the soldering iron tip to it and then feed the solder into it. But because these pads are so fragile, if I touch it for too long, there's actually quite a good chance it can lift the pad and destroy the Tabtech engine, so I have to avoid that risk. That's why I'm dabbing it instead. With the first pad tinned, I'm now going to do the same for the other one. With the pads tinned, it's time to attach the wires. Now, you want to make sure there's enough wire to go around, and normally I would start with about 20 centimeters and then trim it down when it comes to fitting the Taptic engine. And you can see I've reapplied the Captain tape just to expose the first contact. And when we attach the wire, it will be running off to the left. And now we do the same with the second cable. When both cables are attached, it's important to see if they worked or not, so we're just going to test with a multimeter for continuity. And we can see there's partial continuity, and that's the result we're looking for. If there's no continuity, then it means the cables aren't properly connected, and you need to reapply the solder. With both cables attached, I'm now going to firmly hold them in place using electrical tape. This is so that the cables don't wiggle around and break the connections on the board. Now we're all set to install the Taptic engine. In this tutorial, I will be using double-sided tape, but something like epoxy glue will work much better to carry the haptic output from the motor. I'm going to secure the Taptic engine into the bottom right corner here. And it's important to make sure that there's space on either side of the Taptic engine, because on the right is where the clips will attach to the back case, whereas on the left is where the battery connector will go. And if the Taptic engine is placed too far to the left, and when we put it back together, it can crack the connection and snap it off the board, and we don't want that to happen. Now, if you've installed the 3000 mAh battery mod, then the placement will be slightly different. Instead of being on a back casing, the Taptic engine is now on top of the iFlash adapter, and the wires are fed through this area here, between these two clips, and onto the back casing. But otherwise, the rest of the procedure is the same. When it comes to securing the wires, make sure that they are fed through the curvature of the back casing here, and that they are not too close to the rails. If they are, then they might come into contact with the clips during reassembly and become damaged. With the wires trimmed and tinned, it's now time to connect them to the board. We will be using these two connections here, and not this third one here. What's nice about this mod is that the polarity doesn't matter, this is because the motor is bidirectional and accepts alternating wave current instead of a continuous direct current. So we can attach either wire to either pad and it'll work. There's not a lot of room to work with here, so take your time and be careful not to accidentally bridge any connections. Once that's done, we can cover up the connections and give it a quick test. Don't forget to go into settings and make sure that the clicker has been set to speaker mode. Now, moment of truth. Can you hear that? That is the sound of the Taptic engine, and that means we've been successful. Before we close up the iPod, there is just one last thing we need to do, and that's remove this phone spacer. With that removed, we can now clip everything back into place. And there you have it, we now have a flash modded iPod 4th generation with an official Apple Taptic engine. It's a little hard to describe what the haptic feedback feels like through a video, but it resembles that with a dial clicking into place. Many people assume it's like a buzz or a vibration of a phone ringing, but that's not true at all. Rather than a buzz, it's more like a very short tap or click, almost like something striking against the inside of the iPod. The closest comparison would be like the haptics of scrolling through the clock when setting an alarm on a recent iPhone. With that being said, 
I would like to thank the members of the r slash iPod Discord community once again for the kind feedback and help during the making of this video, especially the usernames Professional Idiot for their help testing this on a fifth generation. In the next video, I'll be looking at how to do the same mod, but for an iPod Mini. Until then, I'll see you next time.